So I checked the status of this soldier. He's got no holes in him. He's, he can breathe. He's in shock, but he's, he's relatively fine. I see what I'm dealing with, and my right leg is just chewed up. It really didn't look much like a leg. It looked like something had gone through a meat grinder. And I can see the river of blood flowing from me. So I know my femoral artery has been cut. Okay. So I grab a tourniquet. I put that on, tighten it down. Doesn't do really anything. I grab a second one off my kid. I put that on. One of my teammates gets to me. Uh, he applies a third tourniquet. He gets IV access for blood or meds. And then he goes on to do the rest of the work he had to do. There were, there were 12 of us on the ground. Uh, three of us were, three of which were killed. And then another nine of us were wounded. So, and then about eight or nine Afghans. So a complete mass cal scenario. There's just, there's bodies all over the place. Our infantry soldiers that were there, uh, the ones that weren't coming out of this op, these guys responded to the ambush that was going on around us as these guys were trying to overtake our compound. And I can remember laying there at certain flashes of memories of seeing these kids. Most of that, our infantry group, the squad we had, they were brand, fresh out of basic training, young, 18, 19 years old. Seeing these kids uh, take up these fighting positions and these, these little mock towers that we had built, you know, and just just getting after it uh, with most of the SF guys down, killed, or dealing with the scenario that's happening. These kids just like, these soldiers, man, they just took ownership of the situation and just began going to work. And I can remember just this enormous sense of pride that I had for them. Um. <sighs> I, yeah, so the interventions are on, three tourniquets are on. I'm still bleeding out. I get basically full desperate mode. I grab some gauze, and I end up ramming that up into one of my wounds to try to feel for the pulse of the femoral artery to apply direct pressure. So I'm doing that, which is really the first time the pain kind of kicked in. I'm scraping past shattered FEMA. And it's like surging through my body and I'm losing peripheral vision. It's like I'm being choked out in jujitsu. Like it's only a matter of time before I'm going unconscious. I'm like, all right, man, yeah, like stay hanging there, hanging there. I think I feel something, you know, I push down and I feed the rest of the gauzes on top of that, secure the tourniquet back on top of that. And then I go unconscious. Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. How do you like doing the public speaking? Because you've been at it now for a couple years. Mm. It will always be, more than likely I should say, it will, it will always be somewhat out of my comfort zone. I'd say the one gift I'll call it I have when it comes to public speaking and orating and instructing during workshops and whatnot is just a lack of fear of it. Most people statistically are more afraid of public speaking than death, which is an, a, a stat that's been researched several times. I lack the fear, which is certainly valuable, but the idea of being on stage with a spotlight on me and a microphone in my hand will likely always be uh, an awkward place for me to find myself. Do you, <clears throat> obviously, and we're going to get into your, your injury. Do you think if that hadn't happened, there would have still been the desire to, to be in front of a crowd like that? I, probably not. No, because I never had a desire to do it. I was forced in front of people following me being wounded. You know, when I came back from my first deployment as an amputee in 2015, 
this is the first time that this has ever happened. So the Army and USASOC and SOCOM and my unit, you know, they, they wanted to highlight what we did collectively. <clears throat> and I found myself, you know, with in interviews and talking to members of Congress about stuff. And I was just like pushed into this spotlight position and I fought it and, you know, tooth and nail. I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing any of this stuff. I learned very quickly that when a three-star general asks you to be a part of something like that, he's not really asking you <laughs> anything. You know, it's like a polite way of saying, like, you will be here at this time. Voluntold. Yeah, very much voluntold. So after me declining a couple times, it was made very clear to me that that is not an actual option. So if that had not happened, odds are, overwhelming odds, uh, that I, I would not be doing stuff like this today, man. So was your, at the time, right after the injury, as you were getting back into it and getting back with your team, was your desire to kind of keep it more private and try to stay as private as possible? My goal was to remain exactly the way things had been when I had two legs. I was an operator on a team. And I was a warrior. I was a war fighter. I was good at it. Like, that's what I do. And I didn't want to be treated any differently than anybody else. I wanted to be just another guy on a team doing a job. And, you know, in many ways I was, you know, that I was another guy on the team with a job to do. Uh, but there was also this uniqueness about me that I eventually recognized to be just objectively true. And then having been pushed into these positions, you know, multiple times, it was then that I started to see the value of doing those kinds of things and the return on that investment. And although it was still uncomfortable for me, I was like, oh man, well, this is, this is helping some people. And that's a, that's a good thing. So maybe the general was right. Maybe you do now have an obligation to share the lessons you've learned and the experiences you've been through and what we've been able to overcome as a unit. Maybe he's right. So then did that just begin just the gradual move into the public space and you know, social media. And I just began like slowly putting stuff out and it didn't take long for things to just kind of explode. And then, and then that effect that was being created was growing more and more and more. And then that's when it became more, I became more interested in, in doing it. So it's that giving back aspect that kind of drove you and kind of showing to others what you can do with the right mindset. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to take this opportunity for this podcast to kind of give you the opportunity to be more of the teacher role. And that's kind of my mindset where I want to go with this. Obviously your accent, and we don't need to rehash it. You've said it a million times in your story. Anybody who's followed your story knows this, Boston Mass. Mm. Grew up playing sports was kind of your thing. Yeah. And where I'm going with this, and I'll, I'll get there quickly. You ended up getting recruited to play football. Football was what drove you. Yesterday, I heard you speak at, at your presentation. And one of the things you said was, as a kid, you lack structure. Mm. And in my mind, there's that dichotomy because to get, to drive yourself to a level of being recruited to play football and going off to college to play football, but not having structure seems to. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I would say that when it came to my athletics, I was structured enough to get to practice do as I was told, which really is something separate, and be where I needed to be at the time and place in the right uniform for that particular task. Outside of athletics, I lacked structure, discipline. I mean, it was present enough, right? Uh, but it, was, it wasn't anywhere remotely in the same neighborhood as it is now. So, yeah, I mean, sports and, and we turned into football specifically my later years in high school when it was just everything was football. That's where I gained a lot of that structure, mentality, team dynamic. But outside of sports, man, I really lacked that kind of stuff. Was it more of then if it didn't really interest you, you didn't really put the interest or the effort towards it? Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. And so... In high or going into college, what was your plan for your future at that point in time? Going into college, the game plan was 
play ball, and have fun. That was it. I think I went into school because I think I had to declare a major. It was like business something, which is ironic because now, you know, I'm a small business owner and entrepreneur. At the time, I was like, okay, whatever. And I walked into, I think it was calculus or pre-calculus my freshman year. And I'm like, yeah, this is not happening at all. I left, went to my advisor. I'm like, get me out of calculus. He's like, cool, these are your options for majors, <clears throat> which is how I landed on criminal justice. Uh, he was the head of the department. He's like, criminal justice, you could take that. You know, you don't need to take calculus. I'm like, cool, sounds good. I, I could not have cared any less. It didn't matter to me. You know, I was like, as long as I'm eligible to play, uh, it, that's, all that, that's all that matters. So I had no legitimate whatsoever game plan beyond college. Aspirations of actually trying to try out for the NFL? I would say that it was present just because I lived and breathed football, but I didn't, even the game itself, uh, I didn't take it seriously enough with my studies in particular, my understanding of the game, like the mental aspect of the game itself. I didn't take that seriously enough. Um, and I was, I was undersized early, which sounds weird, but so I started college at 17, right? My birthday's in September, so I'm like right on that line. And I was, I was this super young kid in school every year. Like my classmates were, most of them, at least one year older than me. Um, so, and I was late to the puberty game. So I didn't start like developing until right around my freshman year of college was when I started to like kind of fill out and grow. So I had like a year behind everybody else. I was giving my father shit. I'm like, dude, if you would help me back like two years, I'd, have I'd be playing it. <laughs> on Sundays. Yeah, I'd have it would be a whole different thing. I'd be playing on Sundays for the Pats. So was the idea there that they playing in, you know playing in the league would be awesome? Yeah, but not. It wasn't a strong enough desire for me to do all the things that were needed to do for me to make that something real. And so, as you've said, nine eleven happened sophomore year. You had already kind of looked at the military prior to that, though. But obviously, the football kind of took you towards college. When you chose to go towards the military, there, I've heard you talk about how you were just extremely pissed after 9-11, but also in your backstory of constantly kind of being bullied and picked on as a kid, was there also part of that thing of just wanting to give back as a protector? Mm, that's a great point. Um, yeah, that, that would have been present, I'd say beneath the surface and maybe some subconsciously it was there. I've, I've learned over time that my protective instincts is, is quite high. And in, in fact, that, that's a, it opens up a vulnerability, which I, which I've experienced and I've demonstrated that in real time. And it's created some difficult consequences to accept. So I would say yes, that that was present because I now know that that's been a big part of me for a really long time. But on the decision-making level of like my reasoning, it was anger, rage, and I wanted vengeance. And you chose Army, a couple reasons. One, the other, the other, at that time, the Marine Corps and the Navy didn't have the pipeline to go straight into special operations. Mm -hmm. Army offered you that op option. You've already mentioned your size. You were quite large, comparatively speaking. Mm. You made active attempts once you went down the Special Forces pipeline to drop your size down, but you still went in about 240 from what I've heard or heard you say. Yeah. Hindsight, for those big guys looking to go into Special Forces, would you even try to have taken off more weight today if you were going through <clears> it? It's <throat> a good question. Um, I was perfectly happy with my weight and body composition and performance capability when I showed up to basic training, more than happy. The reason why I cut so much weight is because, you know, I played four years of football, but it took me another two to graduate college. So the last couple of years I was in school, I was done playing ball. I just, I got more into powerlifting and strong man and stuff. I was doing VIP security and nightclub security. So being just big, was advantageous for me. And I just wanted to see how big and strong I could get because I didn't need to be as athletic on the field anymore. So I yoked up to like over 300 pounds. Now I'm six, five, six, six, but I was a big cat. 
And it was then that I'm like, okay, I'm going to go into the military after I graduated. So I was way too big. So then I just developed my training program and my nutrition program to just lean out just based off of the performance I needed to do. So, you know, I looked up five mile run time, two mile run time, et cetera, built my training plan. I didn't have a height, weight, body comp goal in mind. It was just based off of the numbers. I need to do X number of pushups in two minutes, sit-ups, you know, that was it. So I trained that way. And what I ended up being was, yeah, right around 245 when I showed up, but I was like sliced 245 because I had lost, you know, like 60 pounds over the course of maybe like 18 weeks, something like that. So what I typically tell people interested in coming into the military was a physical preparation is is the number on the scale can be quite deceiving. So I wouldn't pay too much homage into that or pay too much attention to that. You know, you know what the numbers need to look like for your performance. So build your training plan around that. And then know that when you go into basic training, uh, especially if you're going to go the 18 x-ray route, like I did, that's like 18 weeks long or something. You're a lot of what you built, especially muscle, is gonna come off of you while you're in Fort Benning, Georgia, going through basic training. Like, there's no weights, you're not getting nearly the kind of food you were probably getting before. So, a lot of that's gonna change anyway. I would be just much more performance driven, regardless of you know your height and weight, and keep it focused on that. You mentioned yesterday during the, our present or your presentation that. At one point in time, based on your height weight ratio, the military considered you morbidly obese. <laughs> yeah. Was that even when you first went in at 245? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe when I first, yeah, I was considered morbidly obese basically my entire time I was in the military with two legs. Now I'm not um, because I'm missing like 50 pounds of leg. Cheater. Would have been there, right? <laughs> when people ask me, what do you, you know, what do you weigh? I'm like, yeah, I'm like two, you know, 17, 220. They're like, no way. That's impossible. I'm like, well, I'm missing 40, 50 pounds of leg. They're like, oh, okay, well, that don't make sense. But as a two-legged guy, I was morbidly obese. And they may have changed the verbiage since then, since I showed up on day one, which is, of course, funny because... I have visible abs, you know what I mean? Like I had veins going through my shoulders and it's like, hey, you're morbidly obese. I'm like, what? You know, this is like <laughs> insanity, you know, but that's based off of just your height and your weight, right? So as someone who's six, five or six, six, whichever I was at, there's a weight associated with that. And if you breach that weight, then, and it's a, it's a relatively low weight. I want to say it was like two. 17 or something like that somewhere where i'm at now actually because now i'm no longer overweight so when you're when you found overweight then they take out the tape measure and they tape your neck like the the circumference of your neck and your waistline and they do that a few times and then there's some ratio between your waist and your neck that once even though your weight is over your physical dimensions then put you back under to an acceptable limit so they do allow for some sort of variance in the body, the height, weight. Yeah. There's a way to further examine if the number on the scale is over what it quote is supposed to be, then the dimensions of your waist and neck can justify why you're overweight per the army standard. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. And referencing to your book now. You mentioned in the book of not taking care of your feet, and part of it was driven by when you would get done with whatever evolution you had to do, your prior or your bigger priority was to go get some food. I don't know the medical or the, 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 the science behind it, but do you think part of that was driven by your size and needing to eat more? Hmm. Uh, pro man, maybe. I, I doubt it, though. I mean, regardless, you come in to selection at 170 pounds, or you come to selection at 250 pounds, you're going to be starving when you get done with, some, with these things. So, you know, yeah, you can start looking at like metabolic breakdown and stored body fat and muscle, and there's more fuel on the body to use as you start pushing it. Now, that, that's a thing. But in terms of just being hungry at the end of some of these things we go through, everybody's hungry. So me prioritizing food over medical was probably just based off of my 
emotional decision making desire to <laughs> feed my body now and like I'll deal with my feet later or not at all. And it, it comes up a couple times in the book. And you, you do have a, a sense of fuck it, I'll deal with it later in, in several different things. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of maybe just your natural makeup, you know? Yeah. And despite, you know, the instructors are there, the cadre are there, they're telling you the right thing to do, you know, take care of your feet, like take the two minutes, three minutes and just like do your examination, like see where you're at, see if you got any hot spots. If you do like deal with it now, like eat later, shower, well, we didn't shower, but sleep later, like, sa- like t- they, they tell you, they're literally right there telling you. And you're like, Roger that. And then, of course, mo- half of us, you know, don't do it. one the other. Right, like, Roger that, and we go get food and go to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> like, okay. Any other issues that you ran into during that selection process, being a bigger guy, that you could give advice? Uh, I mean, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, you know, being a taller guy, some of the longer distance runs, you may have an advantage. Um, certainly when it comes to ruck matching or just rucking in general, like a longer stride is typically an advantage. But then you, when you get into some of the body weight specific stuff, like climbing ropes, um, pull-ups, uh, bigger, bigger people will have a greater resistance to have to move. But these are all marginalized entirely based off of your training. You know, there are, there are guys I was in selection with that are, five foot six and they're fast and they can run forever and they can do a billion pull-ups and the studs. And then there's bigger dudes like me that can do the same thing. And then there's everyone in between that can't. So, you know, when you, when you train as you're training up as the height you are and at the size that you are or trying to get to prior to going in, I don't think it makes nearly as much of a difference. I think a lot of people, and I'm not, this is not what your line of questions about, but I get this often where it's, you know, I'm 240. I really want to be at 232 before I go to selection. I'm like, dude, it's not going to make a difference. Like the seven pounds, like you're, in my opinion, your mentality is an entirely like disadvantaged place. Focus on what your body's capable of, not what it's, cons- what it consists of. Now, if you're 250 pounds of fat, <clears throat> yeah, you're going to need to lose some weight, but chances are if you're 250 pounds of fat, you're not running the times you need to run anyway. Right. So body comp is a thing, um, but performance is what is going to determine whether or not you are selected or not. You've deployed, um, and I want to hit on this story because it's so poignant. March 11th, 2013. Mm. Can you walk me through it? Yeah. I'll go kind of fast and you can dive into as much details as you want, but we were tail end of the trip. We're about to head home in a couple of weeks and we're going on a joint operation with our dedicated Afghan partner force commando element. And then we had some Afghan national army guys and Afghan national police guys on this day as well. Get ready to go out. Vehicle, um, vehicle infill. So we got all of our trucks behind us. Cotton of Force comes to our compound, and we had developed a, an SOP where just the leadership of these units would come into our motor pool, and we would tell them what we were doing, and then they would go tell their troops. So the, the soldiers would stay outside of our compound. That was just to minimize how many people we had around us. We're, if we're all grouped together, you're in a really vulnerable position. And we did it that way for months without, without issue. On this day, leadership comes in, and then a Ford Ranger pickup truck also drives in. And I notice it. And I know it's a violation. And rather than dealing with it right there and then, I decided to wait. And I'm going to deal with this later once we get done with, with our work for today. Well, as soon as we get done with our mission brief, we're doing our final combo check. I turn and I start walking towards my truck while the guys are finishing their comms checks. And I'm about halfway to where my truck's parked. It's already running all my gears in the back. And I hear the rounds start cracking from behind me. Turn my head and a dude from the Afghan National Police Force had climbed up on the back of that truck, that Ford Ranger, and opened fire with a PKM machine gun into me and my team from about 30 yards away. So quite catastrophic. See that and... 
you know, I know what I'm supposed to do in that scenario. I've trained on it a bunch. I've done it live a bunch. It's, uh, it's either move to cover and eliminate the threat or salt through. Like, that's it. It's one of those two. Well, I don't do either because one of my teammates is actually an infantryman that was working with us this deployment. We had a small contingent of infantry soldiers that were there with us, and mostly they were doing base defense for us while we were going on ops. But we started train. We were training them, and we started bringing them out with us more and more and more over the deployment. So this this kid was set to be a driver for us. Well, I see him, and he's just like frozen, man. Um, completely pale life is drained out of his body and he's just standing there meanwhile everyone else is like scrambling or falling or you know moving i see him and uh and rather than doing my job i move towards him and he's not more than seven eight feet in front of me so i get to him he and i go chest to chest my back i turn towards the shooter and that was when i was hit for the first time was in the top of my leg And in my mind, as I'm moving towards him, I was basically just going to kind of like barrel through him and move behind one of our vehicles. That was kind of the, what I envisioned. But as soon as I get to him was, was when I took that first round and it just, it knocked both of us over, you know, PKM from 30 meters is like getting hit by a truck. It is, it is powerful. So it knocks us over. And that's when I feel the additional impacts to my legs. So I know I'm hit. I drag the two of us maybe five, six feet to get just a little bit of cover behind one of our vehicles. Uh, one of my teammates comes in. He eventually takes out that dude, you know, boom. So he's down. And my, my, my thought was I see him drop. I see the gunman drop. So I know he's out. And I'm like, okay, cool. This, that's the threat's been neutralized. And now I realize that we're getting rockets and machine gun that's pouring in from all around our compound. You know, so. We're in a, it was a coordinated ambush. I have no idea how many, how many enemy guys are outside, but I know there's, there's a decent amount, but I also know I'm in no position to address any of that. So I checked the status of this soldier. He's got no holes in him. He's, he can breathe. He's in shock, but he's, he's relatively fine. I see what I'm dealing with and my right leg is just chewed up. It really didn't look much like a leg. It looked like something had gone through a meat grinder. And I can see the river of blood flowing from me. So I know my femoral artery has been cut. So I grab a tourniquet. I put that on, tighten it down. Doesn't do really anything. I grab a second one off my kit. I put that on. One of my teammates gets to me. Uh, He applies a third tourniquet. He gets IV access for blood or meds. And then he goes on to do the rest of the work he had to do. There were, there were 12 of us on the ground. Uh, three of us were, three of which were killed. And then another nine of us were wounded. So, and then about eight or nine Afghans. So a complete mass cal scenario. It's just, there's bodies all over the place. Our infantry soldiers that were there, uh, the ones that weren't coming out of this op, these guys responded to the ambush that was going on around us as these guys were trying to overtake our compound. And I can remember laying there at certain flashes of memories of seeing these kids. Most of that, our infantry group, the squad we had, they were fresh out of basic training, young, 18, 19 years old. Seeing these kids uh, take up these fighting positions and these these little mock towers that we had built, you know, and just, just getting after it. Uh, with most of the SF guys down, killed, or dealing with the scenario that's happening. These kids just like, these soldiers, man, they just took ownership of the situation and just began going to work. And I can remember just this enormous sense of pride that I had for them. Um. <sighs> I please yeah, so the interventions are on, three tourniquets are on. I'm still bleeding out. I get basically full desperate mode. I grab some gauze and I end up ramming that up into one of my wounds to try to feel for the pulse of the femoral artery to apply direct pressure. So I'm doing that. 
which is really the first time the pain kind of kicked in. I'm scraping past shattered FEMA and it's like surging through my body and I'm losing peripheral vision. It's like I'm being choked out in jujitsu. Like it's only a matter of time before I'm going unconscious. I'm like, all right, man, yeah, like stay hanging there, hanging there. I think I feel something, you know, I push down and I feed the rest of the gauze on top of that, secure the turning kit back on top of that. And then I go unconscious and I'm really in and out of consciousness. But what ended up being the next hour and a half before I was eventually loaded onto a helicopter. But we had medevac birds on station within just a few minutes, but because of the ongoing fight on the ground, they, they can't land the bird. You know, they're not going to risk the bird until we can get the situation on the ground under control. It took about an hour and a half for that to happen. I'm getting loaded on the bird. And I, I remember having this thought of like, how am I still alive? I should definitely be dead already. I didn't know how much time had gone by, but I knew it had been a decent amount of time. I get loaded on a bird and they fly me and two of my teammates to an outpost that had a forward surgical team, an FST, because it was the closest, they were the closest doctors to where we were located. And we get there and they pull us off. They pull me right into the operating room. Blood transfusion goes on board. I'm like out of blood. Like I am drained completely. So I need blood bad. Blood goes on. They're fixing my femoral. They're putting that back together. They get that done. And right when they were done, like the last stitch goes in on my leg and everything crashes in my body. Everything begins to crash. So like liver, kidneys, lungs, heart, they're all dying. All my vitals are like plummeting. And they're like, what the hell's going on? They didn't know what were wrong, what the problem was, but they're like, we need to get this dude to Bagram, like now. So two medevac birds had come in back to back. I was on the first with two of my friends and then three more of my teammates came in behind me. So six of us came in within like a minute or two. And we just completely overwhelmed what this, what this facility could do, what the staff was capable of doing. So they started re-diverting everybody else straight to Bagram, which is farther away, but has a full-blown hospital, all right. the resources. Well, I crashed to like get him to Bagram. There, these guys are maxed out. Like we can't, we don't know, we don't know what the problem is, and we cannot deal with this dude right now because we got five other guys that are all in critical condition. Like, get him on a bird, send him to Bagram. So I'm on a helicopter now. I'm flying to Bagram, which is like ten or eleven minutes, and it's when I'm airborne that they realized that they had given me a transfusion with an incompatible blood type, and that that's what was killing me. And they were like, "Oh shit." Uh, that just happened. And people immediately want to know how, because that seems like it's an impossible thing to do. Um, and in the medical world, that is considered the impossible scenario because there's so many protocols in place when it comes to blood. That even in med school, like they teach this. I've had a chance to, to talk to, you know, med students and other trauma surgeons. And like, we teach this in med school, but we tell the students, like, you will never see this. We just have <laughs> to tell you, like, what would happen if it did, theoretically. But this does not happen. Well, it did with me. Well, the civilian world, the, the, the ratio of times that they deal with that level of a mass casualty event is sure. once in a career, maybe. Maybe. And, and the doctors in a, in a forward operating you know, position are probably seeing that on an hourly basis. <laughs> right. And the protocols are, are different. At least they were. And they still are a little bit. But um, they realized that they had been giving my blood or my blood type to my teammate and that they were giving his blood type to me. So they just switched up our names. We were in two beds right next to each other. Very similar last names. It began with L and A and they just swapped us. Well, fortunately for my teammate, I'm O positive so I can give blood to anybody and they're fine. He's a B negative, which does not work with me. So he was good, but that's how they realized they went to switch out his unit to a new bag. And they were like, uh, what are we doing? And they checked to see what they had given me. And they're like, yep, that's definitely what happened. So they call Bagram and I'm like four or five minutes out airborne. And they said, Hey, we just gave Nick a whole bunch of blood. That's, that's killing him. Incompatible. There's no way he makes it to you. It's, it's impossible. He will be dead by the time he arrives. And they're like, all right. And in a lot of ways they were right. I mean, I completely coded. So I had no pulse, no heartbeat. Um, the medics on that bird started getting real creative with ways to keep me clinging to some sort of life. They got, they got wind of what was going on over the radio and they just threw the kitchen sink at me, man. 
you know, because why not? Get to Bagram. They put me in, even though I have no pulse, I have nothing. They put, put me right into surgery anyway. Panels are going. Uh, they innovate me, so a machine is breathing for me. Transfusion, dialysis. And I basically stayed in a vegetated state for, it ended up being like four days. And, uh, you know, the, the new trans, the transfusion with my actual blood type combined with the dialysis eventually will just flush out the toxic blood that was in my body. And I just slowly began coming back. Um, would stay at Bagram for another few days beyond that so I could survive a flight to Germany. And uh, arrived in Germany, was there a day. At that point, they amputated my leg up to the knee. And the next day, I arrived at Ro- Walter Reed. So I do have questions, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah, man. And I know you're active duty still currently, so it, it limits some of your answers, and I, I can appreciate that. I want to go back to the very first onset, and I think about risk and risk aversion. Mm-hmm. When that Ford Ranger pickup came inside the wire, you said you immediately recognized it. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I'm not trying to Monday morning quarterback. Yep. Didn't everybody see this as out of the norm? Yes. And just wasn't dealt with. Correct. In conjunction, was that the first time? Because I believe I've read that at that time period was the height of when these insider attacks were occurring. Mm. Had that base been hit previously? No. That Where we were wasn't a base, and there wasn't anybody there prior. We got dropped off onto a mountaintop with nothing in the middle of the night in the middle of a hornet's nest of Taliban activity. So there really wasn't much history for that spot we were working out of, but there was uh, a growing sense of the insider attack threat at that time, right? This is 2012 into 2013. It had been going on, but it really started to spike going into 13, into 14, into into 15. Um, So this was like the beginning of, of when it really took off and they were seeing how successful it was. We were aware of it. We had protocols in place to prevent it. Um, There's two things here that we use in training now. One is the power of complacency and how no one is immune to that. I don't care how disciplined and how professional you are. Like if you are in an environment for long enough and you start to see things happen without a negative consequence over and over and over and over again, you will become conditioned to that being quote normal. Even if you knew at one point or you know in that moment, like this isn't exactly like the best option, but like I've seen it a thousand times and it's fine. So conditioning very quickly can lead to complacency. Um, and complacency can kill you, and it, 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 it will kill you, and it has killed my friends. We were all subject to that. Five and a half months of going at it hard just about every single day will we'll wear on you physically, mentally, your ability to focus. Crazy things will become a Tuesday afternoon for you. I tell that to some, someone working back in the States, like, this is just normal for us. No, so it's it's a very slippery slope of what conditioning of the human mind and body can do for you in a positive way, but it also opens up this vulnerability for what we would refer to as complacency. So that was absolutely a factor on this day, and we all we all were victims of that of that complacency. Um, and then the second is just you know green berets don't do anything by themselves. We work with and through indigenous personnel. That's that's it. We are in the relationship business. We, we shoot, move, communicate, survive. We slide out of helicopters and jump out of planes and blow stuff up. Okay, cool. None of that matters if you cannot foster and maintain a relationship with someone else. None of that matters. None of the cool guy stuff happens without the ability to establish rapport and maintain a relationship. So it's much more difficult than to just say it's like black and white. Like I'm always going to err on the side of security. But if you err on the side of security too aggressively or too often, you will decimate a relationship or you will fail to begin to build one. Every single situation has to be approached knowing that it's a balancing act. It's like a seesaw between security 
in relationship. If I went extreme security, and I just walked in and said, hey, man, how you doing? I have a quick conversation. And six of my friends are surrounding us, pointing rifles at your head. Like, that's, I feel pretty secure right now. Like, if you flinch, six <laughs> dudes are smoking you, right? Can I build a relationship in that dynamic? Like, no, dude's going to be like, uh, he's petrified. And so that, that's an extreme example right. versus the other end of the spectrum, which is I've never met you before. We walk into a conversation. I walk in totally unarmed and nine of your friends are standing around with guns. Like I do not feel secure whatsoever. I am demonstrating, you know, trust and openness and all these things. So every scenario it has to be approached like its own equation that needs to be solved within the security and relationship dynamic happening at the same time. So it's not quite black and white. Well, and like you talked about yesterday in your presentation, it's about building relationships. And if the situation was reversed and let's say it was U S forces going into an Afghani base mm. and you bring it in an unusual vehicle, it would be the same thing if a, an Afghan sergeant came to you and started chewing your ass out saying, get that out of here. It's got to go through the command structure. When you bypass that command, you in essence get rid of respect to the other side. So you could have been like, Hey, get the truck out of here. But then what does the long-term effect have on ultimately who's his commander to your commander? Right. So yeah. it, it's kind of one of those things that, again, I'm not trying to Monday morning quarterback. I was just wondering, you know, unusual. I'm sure others saw it yep. yesterday. You talked about, and you, you mentioned it here. You ultimately ended up passing out for about an hour and a half and kind of coming to on the bird. And you mentioned his name was Adam, I believe was kind of saying his goodbyes to you. Yeah. You looked up and you saw that you could tell the sun had moved. Mm -hmm. And that was your first indicator of, Oh, wait a minute. I'm still alive. Do you think that was the, when you said I'm in this fight and I'm not getting out of it? Oh yeah. That was, that was the moment because as soon as I knew, so this would have been an hour and a half prior to what you just described. As soon as I knew that my femoral had been cut, I'm like, I'm dying here. That was it. I knew it. I'm going to keep working at this, and then, you know, I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at this problem and see if I can't mitigate it a bit. But I believed with 100% certainty that this is where I would die. So when I'm getting loaded on the bird, and I realized that a decent amount of time had gone by, I was like, Maybe I'm, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe I can fight through this. And that was my first surge of, oh, no, like you're in the game right now. It's a different kind of game than what you've been playing, but it's, it's combat time. And like, let's dig in and start throwing some punches. And I know I've asked you questions about your size previously. So I want to go the opposite way. Have you ever heard of from anybody that because of how big you were, how in shape you were that it actually benefited you because you talked about being on the second bird and basically coding and and the guys on that medical aid ship just went let's see what we've got and let's try it mm -hmm. maybe if you'd been an average size guy it may not have worked i've been told by multiple doctors many of which that have operated on me uh that if i wasn't as big and strong as i was i'd be dead there's a lot of things that are unexplainable on this, in this event on how I'm still alive. Like there's no medical explanation. So it's tough to, for me to place too much emphasis in any particular reasoning because there really isn't one, which is a wild conversation to have with some of these doctors that are like, we say you're supposed to be dead, but like there is no, explanation according to what we know about the human body and anatomy and science that can explain how you live through that. So while many docs have told me if you weren't as big and strong as you were, you'd be dead. I do believe that. I do believe strong people are harder to kill. And that's not just physically strong, mentally strong as well. Like, and they're one and the same, like very intimately connected. So I do agree with the docs with that. Um, that if I wasn't built the way I was, I probably wouldn't be here. And obviously you deal with a full or 
I would call it what a ninety percent amputation on your right leg now. Mm-hmm. That's my stuff. But you also got hit in the left leg too. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that for like probably over a month. <clears throat> yeah, it would have been probably over a month before I I even knew that I had taken a round to my left leg, my left lower leg. It went basically right through my calf. And actually, I almost lost my left leg below the knee. I developed what's known as compartment syndrome, which is where in between your muscle and your fascia, which is like the sleeve that goes around your muscle, it fills with blood and it becomes crazy swollen. And it can get so bad that it can just it can kill all the nerves and therefore they have to amputate. So they did on me what's called known as a double fasciotomy where they basically just slice all the way from your knee down to your ankle on both sides of your lower leg to just let the blood drain out and then get it all back together before you lose too much blood to when they have to amputate it anyway. It's somewhat of a risky decision. Don't quote me. I'm not a doctor. This is coming from people telling me whatever. So they did that. um, And I suffered nerve damage because of the procedure, which is incredibly common. So I'm at Walter Reed and they're amputating my right leg piece by piece by piece, like two, three times a week, just cut, 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 cut. Well, at some point I realized that my left leg had been shot and that I had what was called drop foot because I had no nerve. So my foot was just dead. Like I couldn't bring my toes towards my face. And that drove me crazy. <laughs> so keep like, they're, they're cutting my right leg off one piece at a time. And every time I come out of surgery, I'm just asking them about my left foot. I'm like, what's going on with my left leg? They're like, yeah, yeah, the nerves seem to regenerate. It's fine. Like, they regenerate it like it's like a millimeter a day or like whatever that is. Like, it'll be good. Let me tell you about what's going on with your right leg. I'm like, I don't care what's going on with my right leg. It's already gone. Like, I knew then that this was my left leg was going to be my engine. My, this would be my moda. This, you guys will figure this out and give me something that looks like this at some point. Okay, fine. I need this thing to be working though. So fix my left leg, fix my foot. The doctors eventually started like laughing about this. They're like, we're cutting this dude's right leg off like one chunk at a time. And every time we come in, he's just mentioning how he can't move his left foot. It's fun. It's funny. You know, we look back in and laugh. But you know, it gave me, it gave me something to focus on that distracted me from like the chaos that was happening on my right side of my body. Cause all I was trying to do was pull my foot towards my face all day, like every day. And once that happened for the first time, you know, like my big toe just like wiggled, dude, you would have thought <laughs> like I invented fire or won the lottery. Like at the same time, it was this like massive win. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Like now it's game time. And then slowly it just kind of came back. Well, and that goes back to what you've, we're saying yesterday about the warrior mindset, focus on what you can control mm-hmm. in that hospital bed. My right leg's gone. There's yeah. nothing I can do to control that. Mm-hmm. I can see and feel my left foot is not moving. Mm-hmm. Help me control that. Yeah. And gave you something to focus on. That's it. I want to go into now the doctor that chose to not do a full amputation. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting story because at the time with all of the surgeries you were going through, they were just like, screw it. Let's just take it off at the hip. Has the doctor, have you ever had a conversation with the doctor about what made him go? Let's not go that route. And, and as you described it, he came to you and said, Hey, it's going to be a street fight. I need you in this, but I don't want to take all of your leg. Yeah. Uh, JC will call him his initials. Uh, he's still a great buddy of mine. He's about, he's about to retire from the army. Uh, he's now a full bird colonel and a surgeon over in Germany. He's a, he's an awesome human being. Uh, if I an, if I'd answer this question for him, one is he's he's looked up to a special operations guys for for a long time. He'll he'd, he'd tell you right now, like I, I would do anything to be a Green Beret or SEAL or an operator. He's like it's just not you know it's not not me. You know, it's not me. I don't have the physical capacity, the tenacity. Like, I'm really good at, at what I do as a surgeon, but, like, he's, like, looked up to us. So I think there's a part of him that saw this, you know, 270-pound bearded, like, savage warrior in front of him, and his staff was like, hey, sir, let's just take it at the hip and, like, get him going. And he had this, like, you know what? I think I, I, think I, I can keep this guy in the arena that we all want him to be in and that he wants to be in. 
So I think there was that, just like the respect that he has for war fighters was there. Um, and then he's just, he's an aggressive, he's an aggressive doctor. He's, he's willing to assume risk because he has a high degree of confidence in his skills and what he can do. Uh, there's a fine line between confidence and cocky and JC's like on that line, which is the exactly the kind of guy that I want going into any problem that needs to be solved is that. So he's a high degree of confidence. He's willing to assume risk. Um, because of that confidence, not just in his skill as a surgeon, but because of his reputation as a man and as a soldier and as a lieutenant colonel. Like, if things were to go wrong, he's willing to, like, take that on. Be like, you know what? I made that call, and, like, I'm okay with that. I think you combine those things, and you get a guy who's who's willing to do the work. And what could have been one surgery ended up being close to 40. But he's a worker, and he wants to... He wants to do what he does. And each subsequent surgery he was doing was, he was taking off the absolute minimum just to get rid of bacteria, correct? Infection, bacteria. Yeah. So dead tissue, dead bone, dead muscle, piece but, by piece. But ultimately he knew if he did, and what do you call it where they go all the way up to the hip? A hip disarticulation. If they had gone all the way to there, there was no way you were going to be able to redeploy? <sighs> Man, I, I live in the world of anything is possible. <sighs> So there's that. I would say that if they had done the hip disarticulation surgery on me, it would be as close to impossible as it gets for me to be able to go back to doing what I do now. You talked about when he came to you with this, as you recall it from your drug induced <laughs> stupor, <laughs> yeah. a street, all you knew was somebody was saying, Hey, you want to get into a street fight? And I'm into it. Yeah. Do you know if you had had, or as he told you, had you had any conversations with him, even in your stupor, I want to, I want to get back to active duty? Oh, I told him that many, many times. Okay. So he knew that that was your mindset. I don't know if he knew that right there in the first time we had a, a, any conversation, the moment you're describing, that was literally the first time I met him. And I'd only been at Walter Reed for like a day. Okay. Um, so I hadn't told him that prior to this. But very quickly after, as we had our relationship began developing and he was just cutting parts of my body off day after day after day, I began telling him that uh, quite often. And I think that with him, it probably validated his, his ultimate decision to make and his continuous decisions he continued to make, right? Because he's just like continually cut me up like piece by piece. Eventually, I'm like, hey, doc, you know, I'm going back into doing what I do and I'm going back into the game and I can just imagine being in that, that shoes of his and going, you know what? Like, I think I'm, I'm really comfortable with the decision that I make or that, or that, that I'm making, right? I'm gonna, the, keeping this guy in the game, get, keeping him as much leg as I can leave him with to go back to doing what he's doing probably validated that. And this, my next question, you may not be able to answer this in, in the sense you just may not know. So we're 10 years basically removed from this. So we've got a decade under our belt of military members getting injured in, in battle. And, and cause I've interviewed a, a former seal who had lost his hand and redeployed. So the idea of, of a catastrophic injury and then redeploying is, I don't want to say normal, but it's become more normal mm-hmm. in that moment. And looking back on it, and this is the, the morbid side of it. Somebody listening today, if they end up injured tomorrow, how do you fight to keep what you had if you don't have the opportunity to meet a JC and who mm. is going to fight for you? Does that make sense? Do you have any advice? If someone's going through this but doesn't have the resources to... The, doesn't he, They don't have a, somebody like a JC who's like, hey... Let's give this person every opportunity to get back in the game as opposed to listening to all, as you mentioned, all the doctors outside the room were like, hey, JC, let's just completely yeah. go to the hip. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, is go find yourself a JC. Uh, Will the military let you do that? Oh, you're talking for service members? Yes. Okay. Well, to, to keep this broad, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, but... Like, get aggressive and go find yourself the support and resources 
that you know you need. Like if you're sitting around waiting for them to just magically show up, probably isn't going to happen. And I, I get this quite a bit too. Like I don't have anyone in my corner. Like I don't have I don't have a support system, and and that can be that can be dangerous. Ninety nine times out of a hundred, my my response is, "Well, go find them." Like if you're sitting in your bedroom, this it's not just going to come like jumping through the window. Like get aggressive. Go hunt. Go hunting. In the military. Uh, your options can can certainly become a little bit more limited. You don't have the freedom to just like go do whatever you want and choose what you want. There are ways in which you can um, position yourself around people to enable you the way that you feel and know you need to be. It may come down to a decision point where you have to decide whether or not you are going to risk burning a relationship bridge and, and gaining an asset that you feel you need to have or is going to enable you tremendously. Like you can circumvent the chain of command. I mean, that will almost always be frowned upon and unappreciated by whomever you go around. Open door policies exist, and even if they don't, which would be unusual, you're talking about another human being that has a phone, has an email, has an office. Like you can get as aggressive as you choose you want to. Just know the risk you're taking on and the potential consequences that come with that. I really didn't have to do that too much. My unit, uh, which is third group at the time, were amazing. Right. So we were all in line. My aggressive nature was with the army at lodge when i was going through my med board and they were trying to get me kicked out of the army medically retired it was there that i had to be like that nah, that's not gonna work for me like either change your tune change your mentality or i'm gonna go find someone else you know so i i was willing to burn those bridges because my unit was intact right all the way up my chain of command was was good so it's certainly more challenging when you are a service member on your options. We've got rank, we've got chain of command, we've got protocols, policies, all the things. I just advise those that feel like they don't have the resources around them that they need to take a hard look at what exactly it is you're trying to get. Is it a surgeon? Is it a behavioral health doc? Is it a strength conditioning coach? Is it a dietitian? Like, what do you need and for what? Like, be very clear on your intent and what you're going after. Because the last thing you want to do is make some crazy moves and, gra- and get, a, get what you think you need and it turns out that it's, or it's worthless to you. So do the analysis and then some risk calculus in terms of what it may take to go after that and are you willing to burn or sacrifice something along the way? And all the way up to you starting physical therapy I don't want to overuse the word or, or underplay what happened, but you were very lucky in the sense all the way back to on that bird with the, with the medical staff, the crew willing to try something as opposed to, Hey, he's going to code. So, you know, and not saying that they didn't care. It's just, what are we going to do? He's going to code. You were talking about how they were paddling you and and everything else. So they didn't give up on you having the opportunity uh, or the, the chance encounter JC is the one working that day, that shift, that crew, whatever. And he didn't want to give up on you. So th- there's, there's a little bit of luck involved. in Oh it. my gosh, a ton of luck and a list of humans that all played a role in you and I sitting here talking right now. It's like an endless list all the way down to the, just the, you know, the nurses at Walter Reed. I mean, I call Walter Reed the greatest place on earth you never want to see. I mean, that place, although now I was just there, it's like a ghost town compared to when I was there, which is a good thing yes. to have going on. But just the, the nurses, man, and these, these people that not only do a job that would make a lot of people nauseous, but they do it with a smile on their face and with compassion, and they're, they're helping people that are used to being the one that's called when there's a problem that needs to be solved and they used to be incredibly independent uh, who are now helpless to do anything on their own and these people recognize that and they come in and they do what they need to do but in a way in which 
makes it a little easier for that person to accept that kind of support and that assistance. So was I lucky? <laughs> Absolutely. At many different points. Um, but I'd say more significantly, it's the humans that I was fortunate to have around me that did what they needed to do. That just, they did their job and they did it well. I would place more emphasis on that than luck in general. Correct. Yeah. So now let's go into physical therapy. And, and in the book, you talk to about her, Kelly. Mm, yeah. You're a very strong-willed person. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, and, and I hope people read your book because you, you give several references to how you have, hey, I'm going to do it my way kind of mentality. It seems like Kelly's that same type of person. Mm. Was she that way from the get-go? Yeah, from, from day one. Um, but, you know, my way is aggressive. My way is pushing the limits. My way is all in. My way isn't necessarily, I'm going to do this movement at this time. It's not so much into the mechanics as more so it is more generalized and conceptual. So her and I were hit it off from the moment we first met. She like walked into my, my, my hospital bed room and was like, Hey, I'm Kelly. Um, and we got a lot of work we need to do. And I was like, yes, I love everything about this, you know? And she's like this short, pretty blonde um, from Virginia, very sweet and kind. And uh, so I, at one point I had a thought, I'm like, I don't know, like I'm used to training with like savages, like our strength conditioning coaches at our unit. They're like big bearded, like power lifters, like college athlete, college football coaches, professional athletes. And I'm like, okay, you know, we'll give this a shot. But she's got like a demon in her, <laughs> you know, as sweet as she is. She's also ruthless, savage, who will hold no mercy. Um, so we hit it off right away, man. And it was, it was, it was successful. So. so going back now to, you knew you wanted to get back to full duty mm -hmm. and, and redeploy with your team. Total time it took from injury to redeployment. Uh, two years. And talk about the, the, you don't talk about all the testing that you went through. Cause basically the, the army kind of took you back from crawling to running in the sense of the test that you had to be able to perform with a leg going to your leg. Did you have input on its design and makeup? And did you get to work with the design team because you knew you wanted to get back to active full deployment duty? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, in terms of the hardware, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tried at Walter Reed a ton of different knees and feet and socket setups and ways we refer to as method of suspension, which is how it's attached to your body. I tried a ton of different things. And in fact, a lot of manufacturers in the prosthetics industry, Walter Reed was the place that they would send all their stuff that was still going through R&D. So I became this like guinea pig for a lot of different prosthetic manufacturing companies. So like, oh, like be, try this and just see if it works. Beat the hell out of it. Try to break it. I'd break stuff all the time. I mean, I was like out of my mind. But during the process of trying different components and different fig configurations and alignments and whatnot, all of this was rooted in that. In yeah, I need to be able to get up and walk and stuff and run and whatever. But <clears throat> for me, it was can I make this work in Afghanistan for nine months at a time? It was more so than the performance of what this could do, but the, my ability to maintain it in an austere environment. I was thinking along those lines. It's from the, from the first time I ever had one of these attached to me. It's like a weapon system. Same exact thing. You know, so I went, I, I knew I needed a minimalist approach. I needed less components as possible because like the one I am in now, literally as we're sitting here, this is a much more complex design. Now that I'm off the teams and my cool guy stuff is over, I, I ride a desk. I was able to upgrade or change into something that's built a little bit more for comfort than for, for, than for performance. So there's like more components involved in this thing. It takes me a little longer to put it on. There's more pieces. Well, this in Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq or these places that I would go, it was just too many things that could go wrong, like too many things that could break. So I wanted simple, minimalist performance. 
I needed like a 1999 Ford Bronco, <laughs> you know, whereas now I'm in like a 2023, like, like Cadillac, you know, I can cruise on the highway, but I'm not climbing a mountain in this thing. So that those, those, those ideas were in mind from the very beginning, but you know, did I get to build my own prosthetic? No. Like I had a, several options and I went with what was deemed most optimal. And then I figured out how to make that work. And I've had another guest, uh, also an army vet, um, arm and leg amputee, also a jujitsu practitioner who smashes me like crazy. Wally, you know who I'm talking about. Hell yeah. Um, he talks about his prosthetics where, cause he loves to get after it in the gym also. And he breaks them all the time. Mm-hmm. The VA is really good about replacing them the same way with you. When you something the breaks, they're just right on it and replacing it. Well, because I'm active duty, I don't go through the VA for anything. Oh, okay. So I go through just the army medical process, like any other service member. Um, the short answer to your question is yes. I, I have a blank check when it comes to pros- prosthetics. I, I have, I need an annual referral which is laughable because it's like, yep, his leg is still gone. Here you go. Like, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Every 12 months I get a referral um, that covers me for whatever I may need. So I, I can walk into a prosthetic shop and nowadays it's not nearly as extreme as when I was on the teams and I was doing all this wazoo stuff. And I needed new stuff to, I was breaking stuff and I needed new stuff to do a different task. Now it's things much more calmed down. But when I was on the teams as an amputee, which was, all the way up until about five months ago, I'd walk into my prostitute shop and I'd rack up like a $350,000 bill, like in one visit. And it was like, whatever you need. Oh, so they've been, they've been amazing about that. So run me through the final test that you had to perform mm. talking about, you know, cause in, you talk about like having to do a, basically a, a, a modified pistol squat is the easiest way I can describe it. Yeah. But it was an ass, ki- an ass kicker. At the time, so I was in third group at a Fort Bragg, was the unit I was in when I was wounded. Um, I'm now in fifth group at Fort Campbell. But third group owned Afghanistan. That's all we did. All right? The other groups were doing Afghanistan rotations as well and supported third group as the main effort. But they were also covering all of the rest of the – Special Forces Regiment requirements around the world. All third group did was, was Afghanistan. Because of that, there were a lot of guys that were wounded. That's just what comes with combat. A lot of amputees um, and other injuries. Well, third group decided they were going to take it upon themselves to create a specific physical evaluation designed to assess a wounded warrior's capacity to get back onto the team, to get back into operational status. They built this on their own. They were building it actually while I was in Walter Reed and our head strength conditioning coach who visited me all the time. And we talked a bunch was asking me for input, you know, about this test. Like what things do you think we should put in here? Like we don't want this to be, you know, a a three mile run and you need to do 12 pull-ups or like whatever. We want these to be like tactical tasks, right? Tactical tasks. So I was helping them put it together without me thinking about me doing it. I knew at some point I would need to, but I was just saying, Hey, I would think about this, you know, this, 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 whatever. So they build this thing and they ended up running. I want to say it was like 250 able bodied green berets through it to determine what their standard baseline metrics would be. So this ended up being the last physical, actually my last evaluation period that I needed to do which was after about 12 weeks of time where I was doing anywhere from two to three different assessments a week for 12 weeks. The unit just ran me through the ringer. This was the last one. And the day before I had to take mine, I went in the gym just to like warm up and loosen up and, and get ready. And our group command sergeant major, his name is Mark Eckid. He just recently retired as the USASOC command sergeant major. Mark Eckid and my buddy Chuck are both laid out on the turf. They both had just taken what was referred to as the operator readiness test, the ORT. They had both just gotten done taking it. And they're like on the turf, like out cold, drenched. Well, my boy Chuck, he had taken a round through his hand and he was he had taken it so that he could get back onto the team. And our command sergeant major just took it as like a battle buddy, right? Able-bodied stud, Mark Eckett, still is to this day. He's an animal. 
I walk in, I'm like, Hey, you know, morning star major. He's like, dude, he's like, are you taking this thing tomorrow? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that test sucks. He's like, it just kicked, it just kicked my ass, man. I'm like, yeah, it's tough, man. He's like, all right, well, he's like, you know, I'll be here tomorrow for your thing. And, and I wish you the best of luck, man. I'm like, cool. Thanks. I come in the next morning, like half the units there. I mean, they basically had to close the gym because there was just this entourage of people. My company command battalion group command, a whole bunch of other senior staff, uh, my teammates. And this, there was like 70 people there and it's a 12 event test. All right. So there's 12 physical tasks and you had, I think it's 60 seconds or maybe it was two minutes rest in between each of the 12, somewhere between one and two minutes. Everything is done with a 50 pound weighted vest to simulate wearing kit. And I'll probably forget some of them, but it's a caving ladder climb is one of them. Uh, You have to jump over a series of five foot walls the depth drop, which you just talked about, which you have to jump off of the bat, off of the top of a four foot platform X number of times and like stick the landing. That's where I had to figure out how to do that, which I did this modified pistol squat. Even thinking about me doing that now, I'm like, Oh, I don't know how my knee didn't just explode. I mean, it was brutal <laughs> Tra- training up to be able to do that. There's uh like a cover and move drill where you've got like a rifle and you're moving from one firing position to another. And it's like this static to k- kinetic move. The last event is a treadmill walk, all right? 2.5 miles per hour, just, just a brisk walk, right? And it raises in elevation. It's like every minute or so. And it eventually gets to a point where it's at a 45 degree angle steep and it's on each setting for like a minute or two at the end of 11 prior events this thing is tough it sounds really simple i go ahead and say hey man put go on 2.5 and raise it up to 45 degrees and do even most gym treadmills go to 40 (laughs) no they don't like the ones we had they're these big like beefed up treadmills so it's steep well i realized during my train up that once I hit about 25 degrees or so, I no longer had the range of motion in my right leg to get my foot back in front of me to continue to walk. So I'm like, how am I going to figure out how to do this? So what I, just, what I came up with was once I'd hit that certain degree angle, I would rotate laterally and I would laterally shuffle up the treadmill. So my prosthetic was the trail leg my sound leg was the one that was uphill and I would just laterally pull myself and basically just drag my prosthetic behind me. That way I didn't have to worry about my hip range getting back in front of me. I would just shuffle. Well, my strength coach was like, I don't know if that's going to work, man. I'm like, it has to work because there's what other no other way to do it. Yeah. You can't use your hands. I was like, I'll kind of bear crawl, but it says in the test like you cannot use your hands for anything. In their minds, it was you can't put your hands on like the side of the treadmill. Right. But I'm like, does that does that count? Like if I use my hands on the tread itself, does that break the rule? Because in real life, if you were going up that steep of a hill, you're probably, probably gonna right. go in hand over hand too. So we were like, uh, you know, and these are the guys that created the test. They're like, we weren't they're like, we were thinking about them touching the hand grips on the treadmill. That's why we put that verbiage in there. We weren't thinking someone using their hands like a bear crawl. And I was like, they're like, they actually said, we're good with you doing it that way if you think that that'll work. And I was like, nah, you know what? I think it's just too close to violating the standard that you wrote. So like, I don't even want this to be like potentially like... Uh, you know, like he kind of used his hands, although it wasn't, I didn't need, I want any asterisks, right? So I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing it that way. Cause in a weird way, aren't you fighting big army at this time? No, this is purely my unit. Right. But what I'm saying is it's big army. That's looking for any reason to not let you redeploy. <sighs> at this point, big army really didn't play any role oh, okay. in any decision-making at all. No, okay. all my deployment waivers uh, was all maintained within the SOCOM enterprise. Okay. Um, but everyone knew that there would be a lot of scrutiny and a lot of questions from within the SOCOM community. So that was one we just said, you know what, it, 
it basically to me this reads legs only. We're doing it legs only. Okay. So I determined to do this lateral shuffle. And uh that's the way I did it. And it just took a ton of training. It was it was really hard. I did it on the day of the test. Um I was successful. I come off the back of this treadmill. I'm on the verge of passing out. All right. I'm going to see the wizard. Right. <laughs> it's the peripherals are going away. I'm standing there trying to look like a badass. And our group command team, including Mark Eckett, they come over and Mark's like, dude, he's like, you know, I took, I took this yesterday. He's like, if I wasn't here to watch you do this with my own two eyes, I would have never believed that that was possible. Like what I just saw. And I'm a little delirious at this point. And I said something to the effect of, yeah, man, that's great. But like, what the fuck else do you need me to do? You know, and I'm talking to my group command sergeant major. So my teammates are now laughing because I'm being somewhat disrespectful. He thought it was kind of funny. You know, he's like, <laughs> he's like, it's a fair point. You know, and he looks over at the group commander and uh, the colonel's like, hey, CSM, you know, this is a manning decision. This is your decision to make. He's like, I just don't know how we're going to tell this dude no after what we just put him through. And CSM looked at me and was like, all right, man, I'll have your orders drafted. Um, and you'll be back on the team on Monday. And that was it. And so when was your first date back in country, back to full active duty? I was back deployed like six weeks later. Uh, my team was already well into their train up, you know, for the next pump. And I made it clear that if I was going back, I was going back to that team and they were, they were good with that as well. So it was, it was late. I was late to the game in terms of my prep with the boys for that particular mission. So I realized really fast when I got in country that I still had a lot of work I needed to do. And I know you talk about in the book going or one of the other podcasts, just, you know, the, the reps you had to practice getting out and in and out of a, a, MRAP. Oh, or, right. Out of vehicles, you know, yeah. Because just the things you, you don't think about having to do. When you redeployed, how many legs went with you? To Afghanistan, 15. I brought, I think, six. And I broke five. Um, and then my following deployment, which was to Somalia in 2016, the next year, I think I brought seven and I think I broke six. So I was beating the hell out of these things. And you don't talk about that in the book, but you do mention it when you, so you make a transition, I'm cutting back to the podcast now, you make the transition, you decide you're going to go warrant for your last few years. Mm. During warrant school, you talk about during your last um, evaluation, you've got a long ruck march mm. and you broke your leg and didn't have one with you. Yeah. What was that like? Okay, I'm kicking myself in the ass for... Uh, thinking that I didn't need an extra one with me on that movement. It was a uh, 12 and a half mile infill through Uari mountains as part of our culmination exercise. That was this event. And yeah, my leg started malfunctioning pretty bad. Um, now, when you say it broke, what breaks? <sighs> a few things can break. So, I mean, this knee, which is the type I had on that, that movement, there's a microprocess in it. There's a computer inside this thing, a little computer that basically reads the amount of pressure that I put through the foot, how much force, and then where in the foot that force goes, like toe versus heel. That tells the knee how fast or how slow to articulate. All right, it doesn't power me, but it read, it senses that to determine how fast or slow to, to move. There's a lot of hardware in here. So mo many things can break. On this one, there are a series of gaskets inside this knee that will close or open fluid that in that density of that fluid will determine how robust the knee will hold or how smooth it will move. It's fluid going back and forth, back and forth, regulated by this computer. Amazing technology. All sensing based on your movement and how much weight and pressure you're putting on it. Yeah. Damn. So there's a, there's a cable inside this pylon right here that plugs the foot into the knee. So there's just a sensor that tells the computer, the knee what to do. It's, it's amazing. This knee is like $90,000. Just the knee itself. It's crazy technology. Very fortunate to have this thing. And 
as often as I break them. <laughs> so on this one, I think what the issue was, was I blew out one of those gaskets. So when I was trying, when I was telling the knee to get more firm, it wouldn't because those gaskets weren't able to hold that fluid like it's supposed to. So it just became more of like a free swinging knee. There wasn't a lot of resistance for me to leverage. Um, so I was still able to use it because it could move, but it became just much more difficult. And the decision to go the warrant route, because way back in the beginning, when you first enlisted, you had your college degree, but you chose not to go the officer route. Right. When did you start thinking about the warrant program and was it suggested to you or was it something you just chose to do on your own? There's a single moment in time in which I can remember, um, where that seed was planted. And it was actually the engagement, the gunfight we were in when I was shot in the face. The, I'll spare this story for the sake of time, but our team leader. For those listening, that actually happened before your leg. Right, yeah. You had one hell of a deployment, that one deployment. Right, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a wild trip. Um, but on this event, our team leader, our captain, was severely wounded. And our warrant officer assumed command of our element which is why you, one of the reasons why you have them. And I had been shot, although I didn't know that it was a bullet for hours later, but I'm like pumped, uh, adrenaline, we're in a gunfight, six of my got friends are down, wounded, we're treating, we're returning fire, we're setting up a CCP, you know, we're calling in airstrikes, like all the things are happening. And our radios go down, which is pretty common. And I had a whole bunch of information that I needed to get to our warrant, our chief. He's now the one talking to hire. He's sending up comms, reports, whatever. And I am in like a dead sprint to his vehicle location. And I get there. I'm out of breath. I'm pinging. And this dude, his name's Brian. He's hanging out of the side of a Mat V. Door open. Like had one leg in, one leg out. Rounds are tinging off the other side of his truck. I'm like still all, you know, fired up. He's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. You know, Oakley's on. His hair's all crazy. He's got... Three radios working. He's writing with a Sharpie on his uniform pants. Like he's taking notes on his pants. Three radios, the whole thing. I'm like, chief, you know, I'm, I'm pinging. And he's like, you know, he's on the radio. He's like, hang on a second. He's like, what's up, man? I mean, as calm as I just said that to you is the way he said that to me. Like, what's going on, dude? I'm, and I hate to do this because it, it is a movie and they're actors, but I think of the movie Black Hawk Down and Tom Sizemore's character when they're under fire and he's just taking rounds off the truck and it's like he's just walking through the park on Sunday. Yeah. Hey, the, you know, sir, they're shooting at us. He's like, we'll shoot back. Yeah. Just that, it was that. That's a great depiction. That, that's what it was. I was seeing that in real time. And just his level of cool, calm demeanor that was forged through a ton of experience in these environments and a high degree of training. In that moment, I was like, I want to be this, I want to be this guy. Like you're the guy I want to be. Now, did I fixate completely on the warrant officer part of it? Not, not so much. It was more of him and just his, his ability as a, as a war fighter and his composure. And that's how chill he was. It was almost eerie. I'm like, wow, you're like really good at this, huh? I wanted to be that guy, but that's where the seed was planted. And then I just saw the effect that the warrant could bring to the table throughout the rest of my time, you know, on the teams. And then I also saw what a, what a bad warrant can do and how that can be catastrophic. So I saw it from both ends. And then I, you know, it was time to make that decision as that next echelon of my career was lined up. And I was like, I'm gonna go this way. And I've heard you say this is that now you, you find yourself transitioning in the sense that, War is slowing down. Mm -hmm. There's less young men and women coming into the military today. You guys are seeing recruiting issues the same way the first responder community is. Yeah. But now you see yourself in that teacher role and wanting to give back and leave your legacy of knowledge mm -hmm. behind you. How hard was it to go from absolute tip of the spear to maybe being the back edge of the spear and back in the back yeah. at the desk with the gear. Yeah. It, it's, it's been fun. It's really been just the last, I think f five or so months since I've left the teams and I'm now working as a company operations warrant. So just that next echelon of command at the company is where I work now. And the writing was on the wall 
during my last rotation uh, in Iraq in 20, 20 and, and into 21, um, that my time was about done. Uh, physically, it was mostly physical for me. I just, all the foam rolling and the band work, man, like it just, it took its toll. And even if we were going to go do three hours in the flat range, you know, a 30 minute warm up, a 45 minute cool down and all the ice and it just, it, it, I wasn't able to keep the machine together as fast as I was breaking it down. And I was like, okay, I, uh, I need to start looking at the next chapter of my career in knowing that I was going to be, I was going to be miserable for whatever it was. Uh, at this point I was in 15 years of the last five years of my career. This is probably going to suck, but it's the right decision to make. Well, after being in my current job for maybe a week, I realized how wrong I was. And it was, it's amazingly fulfilling. And although you do lose a little bit of intimacy, obviously with the guys on the ground and with, with the tacticians, with the, with that shallowing, things get also get broader, right? So it gets wider. Your span of influence grows outwardly gets a little shallower, but it grows out exponentially where prior it was me and 11 other guys. That was really my sphere of influence. Can you lead up the chain of command and all that stuff? Absolutely. But most of that bandwidth is spent inwards. You and 11 other humans. Now as a company ops warrant, I have a chance to interact with multiple teams, multiple teams that are coming through. So I get a chance to see like strengths and weaknesses and trends that these silos are really working within ODAs. We work together, but like it stays pretty compartmented. Uh, so that sphere of influence that has now expanded uh, is something that's I'm really enjoying. For me, as I've promoted up, what I tend to say is you get the ability to run top cover for so many people. And it's actually fulfilling mm -hmm. to look down or to look at a team and say, I, I'm facilitating what they need to get their job done. That's my, now my satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot from it. Yeah, it's, it, it is satisfying. It's fulfilling, I think, is the best word. It's, and it's surprisingly fulfilling for me. Would I prefer to still be on the teams? Probably forever. But, you know, man, it's, it's, not, it's not a thing you can do indefinitely. It takes its toll. So I'm, I'm in a blessed position. I'm really enjoying it. I got a lot to learn in this new role. Um, but on most days, I find myself really excited to get to work, which is a good, which is a good sign. So let's talk about you as an author. Sure. How'd the, how'd the idea for a book come about? And I, I will commend the fact that, and I'm sure you're probably going to hit on this. It, your book is not just, here's my life story. I was born, you know, and I grew up riding my butt. It's very much the kind of more focused, at least my interpretation of it, I got injured and here's everything I did get to get back to it. And here's how you can take what I did to adapt it to whatever your fight is. Yeah. It's, I'm glad you bring that up because my most frequent piece of negative criticism is people want the autobiography and, I, and they, so many read this thinking that that's what it is. And it's not, it's not an autobiography. It's, it is basically the answer to that question. How did I do what I did? And yes, there are certain examples and vignettes in there, just enough really to give the reader some context to the point that I'm trying to make, to, the, to explain the value of discipline, structure, work ethic, consistency, you know, these, these different character traits and principles. This book came on the back end of me being thrusted into the limelight in 2015 after a deployment with one leg and me gradually putting myself out there, having seen the value of doing so and getting the question, how did you do what you did? What ended up being thousands and thousands of times and answering that question one after another, I've realized this is wildly inefficient. So I'm going to answer this question and I'm going to have that answer ready to go just so I can speed up the response process. So I took maybe two weeks and I outlined just a phased model, like step one, step two, just like, strategy. I used that for years. And then uh, one of my best friends, we played football together in college with buddies now over 20 years, hit me up randomly. I was just about done with dive school down in Key West. 
in 2020 and he hits me up and says, I think you need to write a book. And I hung up on him. I was like, dude, get out of here. Not interested. Click. He circles back with me a couple of days later. I had just gotten home and he's like, I need you to seriously consider this. Out of respect to him, I did. Um, but if it hadn't been for COVID, which now I had a lot of extra time and energy on my hands that I otherwise would have been spent at work or in the gym or in the fight house or whatever, this probably wouldn't exist right now. But because I had that and I don't do well with idle time, I was like, you know, dude, I have this word doc that I've been using now for like the last three, four years. And it's been effective. The feedback's been overwhelmingly positive. I think that there's something there. And he's like, I think you just found out what your book's going to be about. So I just started adding more and more to it. And I really caught the bug. And this was July of 2020. We were going into Iraq in December. And I just gave myself that window just to see what I could come up with. I was like, all right, I mean, I'm going to commit to this project. This is my thing. I'll get to the time I had to have to push out and we'll see what we got. And between July and like the very beginning of November, I was sitting on 70 plus thousand words and it was like, well, that just happened. And now we have a book. Well, that answers my, my follow-up question. Cause I was going to ask based on your comments of not being really into academics when you were going to school, and when you're going to college, did you go into, once you chose, decided, okay, I'm going to write the book. Did it come easy to write or was it a fight? I mean, were there points where you're like, a quarter into it, whatever, screw this. I'm, I'm not doing this. Or did it just, no, I'm, I'm headlong and I'm going for it. Yeah. I, I, when I committed to doing it for that window, at no point did I really consider quitting the project. There were certainly some days that it was a slug fest. You know, you sit there and just like, nothing's coming to your mind. Like, I don't know what to, what letters to press on this keyboard right now. Others, you get into a flow state and you know, 700 words will just, will just show up. Um, so every day was a little different. Generally, and more so, I was in a really good rhythm uh, where I was ex- I couldn't wait to get to the computer. There were times I was popping up at like two o'clock in the morning and I just had to go right. And I'd be in there six hours. And then my wife would wake up and come in and be like, what, is, what are you doing? Like, are you all right? <laughs> you know, like six cans of Copenhagen and 14 <laughs> cups of coffee later, just like out of ping and out of my mind. And some days you go in there, I sit there for three hours, I wouldn't get a single word out. You know, so it was, it was, cha- it's, it's really difficult. Like writing a book, I'd say for m- most is really hard. For me, it was definitely hard, but I sunk my teeth into it and I caught the bug and it became an obsession of mine. So even in the days where it was really challenging, I just saw that as, you know, just an obstacle that needed to be circumvented. And hey, it's okay if if you only get a couple paragraphs today. That's all right. Because it just means tomorrow you'll come up with, you know. And when you went in and sat down to start writing, did you have a plan in place of I want to write about topic A today? Or was it literally sit down and just whatever I start thinking about is what I'm going to start writing? So I had, you know, an outline to go off of because I had the... I had the guidance portion already mapped out that I had been using. So my strategy was I'm going to add to that and get that to a place where I feel like it has enough information without being too bloated. I'm going to do that in in its entirety. So I just went full into the tenets of the book. Once I got done with that, then I went all the way back and just started looking at stories and examples to put into each section. And that became just like a, like putting a puzzle together. You know, I had all the sections, actually I put little yellow stickies on a wall of like all the different sections. And then I just started thinking about impactful moments that I've lived through, you know, like, okay, some like this experience in dive school, you know what, like this meshes up great with this boom, like this moment and the warrant officer course, when I was going through my infill and my leg broke, like, Oh, you know what? That lines up great with this. Bam. And I just started putting those pieces together. And then I went through my journals and my training logs and talked to teammates and instructors and classmates, and then began fleshing out those vignettes in more detail. I don't know why you would talk about dive school. It went so smoothly for you. Oh my gosh. (laughs) 
This is a train wreck. <laughs> Any other books on the horizon? I'm just about ready to uh, hand the workbook version of this over to my graphic designer. So workbook version of Objective Secure um, is just about done. And in terms of fresh projects, yeah, I, I say I started it probably three or four months ago. Um, but I want to dive into resilience in particular, a term that seems like gets used more and more often in a lot of unique ways, which is okay. Um, I w- I'm interested in dissecting into like what that actually is and how do you build it from like a case study and scientific perspective. We say mentally tough. What is that and how do you obtain it? How many more years are you going to do? Uh, active army how many more years you got i got four more until i get to 20 so it would take something crazy to get me out before that i don't imagine i'll stay in much longer beyond it but you know anything's possible and what do you see as your transition out now that you're establishing yourself as an author and a speaker is that kind of where you think you're gonna go 100 percent you're not going to go back to your old dream of secret service no man <laughs> i think my days of doing the cool guy stuff are probably done Different cool guy stuff, I guess I should say. But yeah, working as a consultant and expanding my company and our team's vision and writing and teaching um, is the direction that I'll go in. When did the idea of starting your own company come about? And what is the company? Right around the same time that this became a thing. You know, my buddy Eric, like I said, who pitched this concept to me, didn't just pitch a book. He pitched like a vision of what we could build all within the self-help, um, personal performance space and a lot of different initiatives. And it's wild to look back that we've actually done just about all of them at this point in a really short amount of time. So we knew we needed to, you know, formalize what that looked like. Um, you know, which we did in the beginning. So right when this came out in January of 21 was when our company was incorporated. Very cool. Closing it out. And, and I've heard you say this before and I've, I've referenced it. So you've got young men coming into the special forces community. Mm-hmm. What pieces of advice do you have for them from all of your experience and what they're heading into, especially going into maybe more of, I'll loosely call it more peacetime Mm -hmm. activity? Particularly for younger people, as important as it is to be able to run fast and do push-ups and carry heavy things and be mentally tough, be able to suck it up through pain, as important as that stuff is, your integrity and your ability to maintain control of that and reference that through particularly difficult decisions will separate you from the average. Is it going to help you get selected? Yeah, probably, but it's going to enable you as not only a man, but as an asset and operator to a team. And this is something that's really easy to say. Do the right thing, legally, ethically, and morally, regardless of who's watching, is like a basic definition that we tend to go off of of what integrity is. Something that's easy to say, as a young person in particular, it's going to be really hard to actually do that. You are going to have to go against the grain at some point, probably at multiple points. You're going to have to dig your heels in and accept criticism and embarrassment and doubt and ridicule from friends or people that you don't even care about. Uh, you, like, you have to be willing to take that on the chin, have that mental toughness, have that resilience to be okay with that in the name of what you know to be right. And the sooner you can just begin living that way, the faster you become an elite asset. Because I'll tell you right now, the highest performing organizations on the planet drastically drastically outweigh trustworthiness and integrity over any performance metric you could think of. How accurate you are with a rifle, how fast you can run, how long you can run, how well you can climb mountains, your max deadlift. None of those numbers mean 
anything remotely close to the value of trustworthiness and integrity. I can make you pretty easily a better marksman. I can make you be able to do more push-ups pretty easily. For me to get you to live with a high degree of integrity, of course, I'm able to influence that a bit, but most of that comes from within. The individual has to just choose to do that and have done so for an extended period of time. So when you think about tough, think about Green Berets being tough and climbing mountains and getting shot in the face and like all this cool guy stuff. I mean, forget all that. Forget all that. Being tough is being at a decision point. You know what the right answer is. Everyone around you is going the other direction and you decide to say, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm, not going with, I'm not going with you guys on this one. I'm standing firm. I'm doing what's right. It's really difficult to do, but I promise you, if you begin doing it, it becomes easier over time and it is going to separate you as a, as a great asset versus those that you will never hear of. I know it probably gets overused, but in my little time that I've gotten to know you, you truly are inspiring and I wish you the best going forward. Thanks, brother. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it, man. I appreciate you watching. But before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you.